this is Dave Wharton. I'd like to talk a little about flutter tonguing today. Flutter tonguing happens in music that's jazz oriented or Broadway, and certainly trombone and trumpet players in the brass family are very familiar with it if they play that type of music. It comes up occasionally in concert band music that is based on jazz themes or Broadway. It comes up more frequently in modern music. Um, the concert band piece Theme and Variations by Schoenberg calls for a little flutter tonguing, and that has vexed some people on audition preparation uh, because it goes against what we do on euphonium. Euphonium is made to produce this nice, beautiful sound. We want a good free air stream in order to do that, and yet when we're going that's getting in the way of that air stream. So to produce a flutter tongue, you really start with a tongue pointed toward the roof of your mouth, is how I think of it anyway, or how it feels to me. If you move the tongue straight up against the roof of your mouth, it will cut off the airstream. Like that, I sort of went hut as a syllable. And now my tongue is positioned this way. If you leave the tongue there and blow through it anyway, even though it's trying to block the air, it will naturally flutter because it can't stop. It releases a little air at a time and then comes back in position and releases more air. That's essentially what the flutter tongue is doing. If you speak some of the Romance languages or some other languages that require rolling certain syllables, uh, then you're already familiar with the concept from that. In flow, the composer calls for flutter tongue in what looks like a simple way. It's on a single note that's sustained, which would seem to be an easy case to do it. However, this note starts with forte piano. Shortly after that, it crescendos, and then during the crescendo, we have to add the flutter tonguing in. That complicates things a little bit. Ideally, you should be able to flutter tongue at almost any dynamic. In the Schoenberg piece I mentioned, it's at a fairly soft dynamic, which is challenging. It can be challenging in a loud dynamic simply because we're trying to move a lot of air, and again, the tongue is getting in our way. I would suggest starting at a mezzo forte, medium volume. I'm going to start with a pure note and then add the flutter tongue to it. The concept is when your tongue starts to block off the airstream, it creates more resistance. You have to meet that extra resistance from down in here. You have to supply a little bit more air pressure against the resistance to make this work. It has to be balanced. If you've driven a stick shift car, it's like balancing the clutch and the throttle. Those two things have to work together to get the car moving. In the case of our instrument here, the tongue's resistance has to be met with a little more pressure from the airstream. Like that. Now to advance the technique slightly, let's try to start the note with flutter tongue. That's not required in this piece, but it's a good thing to learn. It helps you be more flexible with the flutter tongue. Once you've done that, then move the dynamic down. It tends to get, for me anyway, it tends to get harder at the softer dynamics. As you can possibly hear, I'm having a little struggle maintaining tone at that soft volume as I add the resistance of the flutter tongue, but it can be done. With work and practice, almost anything like this can be done. Now I'll try that at a louder volume. There, for me, it's easier to add the flutter tongue midstream like that because I've already got quite a bit of air pressure going. Now I'll start the note with flutter tongue again at that volume. Those are some techniques you can use to get familiar with flutter tongue and more flexible at using it. Now to apply it in this piece on that very same note, we start with a forte piano crescendo and about halfway through the crescendo we add the flutter tongue, but we keep the crescendo going after the flutter tongue is added. So that shows why I'm practicing at different volumes, because as I increase volume, I have to work that air pressure, tongue pressure balance to make sure the note keeps fluttering and keeps sounding. Keep that balance carefully managed because that will help you keep center to your tone. It's easy to let too much tongue get into the equation. 
so it cuts off the tone like that. You don't want that. We want to keep as much tone as possible going and yet get that dynamic pulsating of the tongue for the flutter tongue. Now the other thing that I would try is to add the flutter tongue right on beat three as it's indicated. He has the 4-4 four, four measure split into two half notes, they're tied. And on the second half note, during the crescendo, he says to add flutter tongue. In my opinion, the composer probably doesn't care a lot whether it gets added right on beat 3 or not, however he might. So I try to do it that way, and in some pieces certainly it would matter. So there's the tempo of the piece. I'm going to try to add it right on beat 3. The tie starts on beat 4 to a half note, to another half note, and then across the bar to an eighth note. So the forte piano is on beat four, that first note that I play. It crescendos during the first half note, continues to crescendo during the second half note. It's on the second half note where I add the flutter tongue. I'll see if I can make that all happen and add the flutter tongue precisely on the third tick. That wasn't too bad. Earlier, just for fun, I experimented adding it on beat 2 or adding it on beat 4 instead of on beat 3, just to see if I could keep that flexibility. Again, that may be critical in some pieces, not so critical in others, but I want to be able to do it if the composer wants me to do it. So as with any technique, the more flexible you are with it, the more dependable it will be for you, and the more musically you can enable that technique when the time comes. In this case, I'm going to try to make it happen on beat three if I were performing the piece, because that's what's written, and it certainly there's no reason not to make it happen there. It may be hard to discern that it's on beat three exactly, because I want the flutter tongue to be sort of a soft entrance into the mix here. If it's too hard an entrance, then it, it breaks up the note, breaks up the crescendo in a way I don't want it to. I hope those tips help you prepare to have a good, robust flutter tongue that you can use at will whenever the music calls for it. Thanks for listening.